from Maryland. Maxine Levin recently retired from USDA and RCS as a uh, national leader of soil interpretation. She dedicated her career almost 40 years to USDA, traveling around the world, traveling around the country, studying different soils, and she was one of the mothers of urban soil survey. So today she will share some of her uh, research some of her observations and how they study urban soils um, in the, at the USDA and also uh, teach us about classification, which is also very new. I told it's still being developed and um, Maxim can tell us where they stand right now in the urban soils. It's a uh, really interesting to observe these changes at the, you know, at the Department of Agriculture that they're studying urban soils that were not really um, well, they were neglected before, right? They were like, everything was about agriculture, not much about urban soils, but mm -hmm. now all this uh, urban extension, it becomes uh, more of interest. About 10 years into my career, I had, I had been working in soil survey, doing um, complex soil survey in California, and I got the opportunity to do a soil survey in Baltimore City. And uh, I was all by myself. It was almost like my uh, graduate uh, PhD thesis. And um, I came to Baltimore across the country and uh, uh, started the soil survey uh, by myself, but with very little background. There had only been one urban soil survey in the country at that time, it was 1985. And uh, that survey had uh, been 10 years before and had been uh, really uh, fly by night, uh, though they had done a great job if, with what they had. But there was very little um, uh, instruction or um, description for me. And so I, I essentially had to start from scratch in what I knew about soil survey and apply those techniques to uh, thinking about what I would do with urban soils. And uh, with this presentation, I'll walk you through some of that, as well as um, how soil survey in the last uh, essentially 40 years in urban areas has uh, evolved to something um, quite complex and much more descriptive and partially um, but it's interesting, many of the techniques that I used with that original soil survey in Baltimore City, um, at the end of that survey, uh, not only did I have the manuscript and, and the maps, um, and I went on to an other work in uh, New Jersey and then back to California and all over the world. But when I finished, uh, I don't know why, I can't remember why I did it, but I wrote a little paper um, it was maybe four or five pages, uh, and I must have done it for uh, a presentation in a, in a descriptive thing where people asked me to do it, so I did it. And it ended up being, uh, though it was never published, and it was ended up being um, the background information for the next 30 years for people coming in to do urban soil survey. Uh, and basically, all I did was describe what I did and the thoughts that I had and how I came to my conclusions of how to approach urban soil survey. And I'll cover some of that when I'm doing this talk. Uh, so let's see if this works. Yeah, so let's start with just the idea of urban soils and what they are. Um, uh, in this picture, actually, it describes it pretty well, which is, there's a little piece here in someone's yard that is actually the natural soil. You can see it right here. Possibly a little bit disturbed, but not that disturbed. And then you have an area of excavation, uh, garbage. Uh, maybe there was a house here and they re and they dug it out and redug it and um, and then this is what most people think of as the urban soils, as well as uh, being covered by impervious materials. And, uh, and then other sorts, let's go through some of those other issues. Um, 
in general, you know, the, I, I, we talk about the pride of man and anthro related to humans, uh, anthropocentric um, regarding humankind is the most important, uh, anthropomorphic where things are in the shape of humans, uh, anthropomorphize, uh, uh, giving human characteristics to non-human things. And then we come to anthropogenic changes in the natural world made by humans. And this is how we referred to most of the soil survey work that we did uh, in the last 30 years, because everything's been touched. There's very little except in some of the national parks that's not been touched by humankind and altered in some ways. And then it becomes sort of like, uh, almost like a geologic uh, age, like the, the ice age where the Anthropocene, the current geological age, uh, where most of the overwhelming factors of the human effects on the natural world have come into play. And um, when we do soil survey, you know, we think about the general ideas of, of uh, geologic time and formation um, as affecting soils. And many times it goes, uh, most of our time has been spent in liquid tertiary. Uh, the oldest materials are probably the Pleistocene that we think of as affecting soils and creating the soils that we see. But in fact, the last 20 years, the last 100 years, uh, we see have been significant, but then there's also even uh, before that time uh, working through the Holocene where it was really already the Anthropocene where um, uh, uh, humans had come in and altered the landscape. And with this, you lay that layer on soil survey and thinking about what soils are and how they've developed and it becomes a, a quite a complex process in thinking on how we build our models to map soils and then how we interpret them. So, um, so like with the urban trends right now, uh, most people live on cities. You know, you think, why is it that we would even bother with the urban soils? Because they're, uh, you know, they're so affected by human, human everything and uh, the Anthropocene age. And um, it's mostly because it is so important. It, so much of, the, of our world, not just in the US, but all over the world, is now affected by urbanize, urbanization. And, and, but we're still using those soils, not only for uh, development and, and uh, infrastructure, uh, and where we live and where we work, but uh, and where uh, how we move and transportation, but even for food, we are using what we have now in urban areas for producing food. So it's all extremely important to start looking at soils from a different point of view in the urban areas. Um, and uh, in general, there are ways that soils develop and are affected by urban areas and uh, some of the list of things that are important here. I've got a couple of them listed in terms of urban ecology because the ecology itself actually changes. You've got urban heat islands where the climate is modified directly related to urban land cover and, and human energy use. You've got increased temperatures that, been, that have been enhanced by ozone formation and pollution um, with the ozone uh, pollution crop increasing, um, uh, making a decrease of crop production of more than uh, almost 10%. You've got partic particulate con condensation, which I never really thought about until I started working in this urban soil area where the particulate condensation enhances precipitation up to 10% uh, and ha you have greater cloudiness and fog. Um, it's subtle, but it's there and um, it's interesting. And then with that, you also, with the land cover being as it is, you have surface runoff increase, uh, 
evapotranspiration and water infiltration decrease. And um, all of that as an ec ecological base not only affects the soils, it affects us. And, uh, and then it makes us start to question, are we really resi resilient uh, within climate change in the urban atmosphere and how do we make it better? Um, in general with soils, and I'm sure you've learned this in your um, uh, soils classes earlier since all of you are graduate students, um, the pedosphere or the soil is sort of the center of the ecological base. And, and I know people don't really think about this, but we have a, we, uh, soils has a place in the whole entire ecology, first with the atmosphere, then with the biosphere, the rocks and minerals in the lithosphere, and then the water and dissolved substances with the hydrosphere. So all four areas are so important in uh, considering what, uh, what an ecological base is. And with urban soils, you know, uh, one of the things that first came to mind when I came to Baltimore is I knew that, I knew what I knew. And I knew very well what I should be seeing in terms of natural profiles or uh, natural profiles of soils when I dug the holes. So was I seeing a disturbed profile or was, it, or was I seeing an urban soil, a, you know, a, a, a natural profile versus a totally disturbed profile that had been upset by anthropogenic processes, by human, human input. And some of the characteristics I was looking for, urban soils versus idealized profiles with variable horizons, a modified soil structure, whether compacted or not compacted, but something out of the ordinary and with compaction, uh, waste materials mixed in, was I seeing materials and artifacts in there? And then uh, was I seeing some sort of indication of interrupted nutrient cycling where, you know, you didn't have organic matter on the surface and things weren't cooking. Uh, low organic, uh, and, and, and attached with that was lower, lower um, soil organism activity and high pH. And I'm wondering, you know, if I was interacting with you in person here, I can see you sitting there, but um, I would wonder what each of your specialties are as you're moving into your graduate studies, but you could see how there's potential within the soil profile for all of these activities and particularly in the urban soil environment, which hasn't been studied that much truly, even though we interact with it, we haven't studied it um, in the ways that we should, particularly in the context of uh, anal analyzing and then um, and then perhaps reclamation and, and use. So also other changes that uh, might be uh, are lithologic, lithologic discontinuities, which in normal geologic time are very clear, but also in urban time, they're very, very clear. Um, uh, cumulative effects of historic uses of agriculture, roadways, you know, uh, one of the first things I did when I did the soil survey uh, in Baltimore City is I tried to make first a general soils map of what it would have been if we hadn't had people, if we just had the geology. And I also was very lucky in that I had infrastructure of old um, streams, uh, streams and, um, and basins and old lakes, so I knew what things looked like before. Uh, the maps were from uh, the, the 1800s. So it was very interesting and I overlaid them. And I created what was a general soils map of the real, real world. And then uh, in let's say 1900, and then uh, from that, I started looking for areas where um, the soil had changed and that we clearly had had either um, human activity or total destruction of the soil and a replacement with fill as within backfilled from another site. 
And then I was also looking for whether the soil was native and they had backfilled from, you know, first it was whether it was native and it looked just, and it hadn't been significantly disturbed. I then looked for soils that had been backfilled but had been using material that was close by. So it was jumbled up, but it, it was material that was native. And then in some cases we had fill of real artifacts and rubble. Um, with human uh, effects on urban soils, you're always looking for real specific crazy things like removal of plant and animal nutrients, the, the natural soil. You're looking for drainage, mining, and uh, excavation. You're looking for altered water tables where people have drained or have uh, added water to the system. You're looking for addition of path pathogenic organisms or toxic materials. And then um, you're looking for burying soil under solid fill or water. And these are the important aspects of what I was looking for. Uh, other changes might be um, the natural, uh, uh, you know, uh, processes, whether they were aggregated where, you know, you have lower bulk density or higher bulk density. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that you all know these terms. Um, bulk density is, is the um, particle, is the density of the soil versus volume. And uh, soil manipulation, um, you know, breaking the aggregates, aggregates apart uh, can often increase bulk density in that it's broken all apart, the aggregates, and then they're, they're compacted back together and filled in in the spaces. Um, there's a disrupted, disrupted uh, organic matter cycle with poor structure and low biological activity, because as you remember in your earlier soils classes, um, biological activity creates an aggregated soil that's well aerated and, and functioning properly. Um, you've always have disrupted freeze thaw cycles where water's there and then it freezes and doesn't freeze in odd ways in urban environments. Um, the salt contact, salt content discourages, encourages dispersion, which meaning the, the aggregates break apart and are uh, go to single single file um, single grain type and fill in and we have a helicopter above i don't know if you guys can hear that right now you might have to wait <laughs> um, and then there's a legit a little vegetative cover and you have bare soil and so with that you have erosion so the surface just dis is disappeared and then finally, uh, anthropogenic or uh, human-caused uh, compaction where, and, and you've seen this in all of our um, observations where you have big equipment purposely compacting the soil to create an environment that's appropriate for development uh, and building or, or transportation. Um, uh, this little slide sort of uh, creates, uh, visualizes for you the idea that um, uh, density increases uh, aggregates that are pulverized and fines that fill in the smaller pores. So you have less space for soil air and soil water and organic matter and uh, the mineral matter takes up most of the space in a normal soil pet, head and a soil. It, which means also less space for roots and, uh, and less habitat for soil organisms to um, keep the soil alive. Um, also, uh, you'll see in urban soils, reduced infil infiltration of water and atmospheric gases due to surface crusts and, and general soil uh, compaction. And often that bare soil will become crusted and lose its structure. And then of course, impervious surfaces such as blacktop or, or any kind of uh, sidewalk or, or building will cause runoff and temperature changes beneath the soil. Though on some levels, many of my um, coworkers who have studied 
urban soils have found that sometimes those, those uh, uh, impervious surfaces actually uh, create sort of a stabilization of the soil where you don't get erosion. It's a plus and minus there. Uh, something that, uh, you know, for those that think about things in a chemical way, but it's so important uh, for the development of soil and the use of soil is uh, that pH will increase in an urban environment. Sometimes it's because of de-icing in a cold, hot system, you know, where people are, are trying to do snow uh, removal and they also put in ice. Um, there's a high calcium atmospheric pollution, which is something we don't often think about. There's a release of calcium for uh, construction rubble, for bricks, plaster, and cement. And, um, and then also, even if there's acid rain from other kinds of pollution like coal fire steam plant pollution or industrial pollution, creating the acid rain with sulfuric acid in the atmosphere, you'll uh, still get a washing of calcium from building faces, which creates a raise of the pH. Crazy, huh? And then with soil temperature, it, it, you know, you didn't think about things until you live in a city for a while and you realize it's hot. It's much hotter in the city than it is in the countryside where there's just vegetation. And often the day and night temperatures will raise by up to uh, 1.5 centimeters. Um, there's less wind speed. Uh, there's less relative humidity, and yet um, there's more clouds and rainfall. So all of those affect the system. And then finally, organic matter, uh, low inputs of leaves and litter are cleared away automatically, you know, in the maintenance of, of uh, urban in environments. Um, there's low biological activity, few or no earthworms, and it, as a result, very uh, low fertility for creating a, a, a urban forestry or urban plant life or rain gardens within an urban area. Um, fill materials, um, this was something I saw in Baltimore. It was a very old city and uh, I'd be in a park that looked perfectly natural and digging a hole here and there with expectations and I'd realize, oh my goodness, there's fill here. Uh, a lot of it, and with uh, interesting solid contaminates and leveling and reshaping of the terrain. And uh, many of the wet areas were actually reclaimed with fill or made land. Um, this is particularly true in New York. More than half of New York City along the edges is all filled in wetlands and, um, and where they reclaimed areas, large areas for urban development. And this was in the 1700s. So you think you've got what might be a natural soil and yet uh, those folks in the 17 and 1800s actually were doing the filling. Um, as a sideline with New York, uh, this was something that was interesting with the urban uh, New York soil survey when they discovered this, uh, all these natural soils and parks that were actually pure fill all the way down, um, is that it, uh, the early settlers of New York City were Dutch and they had that tradition of creating just like the little guy with the thumb in the, in the dike of reclaiming land from the sea. So it was in their tradition and they immediately started doing it as soon as they started developing uh, the New York uh, the New York, long before it was a New York skyline, but when it was still farms and open land, they were reclaiming land. Uh, soil contamination is something that's very specific and it's not just to urban areas, it's also in, in industrial areas. Um, and it's different, it's many different kinds of contamination. It's um, not necessarily just uh, chemical con contamination, but also um, the mixing of the soil, let's say uh, for coal mining, where you bring up pyrite, pyritic materials um, that create high acid uh, 
composition when they when they deteriorate and oxidize and it becomes a sulfuric, a sulfuric acid and you have acid sulfate soils as well as in our um, uh, marshy areas and and areas in the in the south as in Louisiana where um, we're uh, reclaiming uh, sediments from uh, from marshy areas or from um, uh, the the bay, like it, for us in the Chesapeake Bay here in Maryland, um, and dumping those materials uh, over the the marshland and their old uh, marine sediments, and they have a lot of pyrite in them, and we're ending up with acid sulfate soils wherever we put that fill and those remnant materials. Uh, solids, uh, this is also a source of contaminants. Um, uh, you've got not only chemical contaminants, but uh, with um, glass, paper, metals, plastic, uh, but also you see plastics and where the decomposition increases toxic compounds and harmful gases. And then of course, with iron and steel, um, you've got huge numbers of insoluble materials that are combining uh, like iron phosphate um, that are um, creating insoluble new compounds uh, with their, their waste. And then the same thing goes for liquids, industrial weights, sewage influence, uh, sludges, industrial wash water and runoff, all of those creating an atmosphere that needs to be, uh, that you know society is asking for us to clean up and yet um, we don't have a strong understanding of how it works and where it is, as well as gases. Um, rain, radon is one that's important in, um, in uh, Maryland. I don't know that it's that important uh, in Louisiana, but uh, certainly gasoline leaks, um, buried industrial waste, waste, this is huge in Louisiana, as well as landfills all over the country where we're looking at the meth methane, uh, carbon dioxide, um, ethylene, propylene, hydrogen cyanide, uh, replacing atmospheric gases and altering the redox status of the underlying soil. Organic waste, uh, one more. Let's see, uh, remnant organic material from early urbanization you might see there, but more important, um, the organic waste from industrial sludge that we've, uh, we've been applying uh, both in a positive but sometimes in a negative sense if it wasn't uh, regulated on non-urban land and imported as fill. Um, you know, we talk about uh, these days using the sludge and composted sludge um, for uh, uh, enhancing soil in, in not only urban areas, but agricultural areas, but um, we need to keep paying attention to the heavy metals in them, as well as with pesticides. Um, not so much here in Maryland, uh, we've got a lot of controls, but I know in Louisiana, this is a big one, um, and chlorinated hydrocarbons and other banned um, uh, pesticides persist in the soil and the decomposition is um, slowed by low biological activity, which means that uh, it's often hard to get rid of these substances, particularly in urban areas where um, it's, not, uh, it's not regulated. And also um, it, as a rule, we have lower biological activity in the urban areas and heavy metals as well. Um, here are some of the sources of heavy metals. Um, I'm not gonna go through the list. Um, arsenic is one that Dr. Palseva uh, studied quite a bit for, or, uh, for our uh, gardening in urban areas. And that was what she did her PhD on along with many of these other metals. Um, but these are important heavy metals that we need to keep track of. Um, and uh, with the original 
soil surveys of uh, USDA, of course, we, we never paid attention to these. And uh, it's an opening for um, graduate students like you to, to do studies in these areas um, to start working in urban areas and, and helping society deal with these, these chemicals. Um, these are two examples of water units, uh, organic uh, rain gardens and, um, and just New York City uh, in general. You can see that line there with the sediments in that space. Uh, often it means plant choices, but also um, working through uh, soil amendments uh, for reclamation. And uh, Dr. Paltzleva uh, definitely uh, sees this as a familiar site of many of the ways that we are trying to reclaim and work in urban environments um, where we're creating places for food, but yet at the same time, we have to think through um, what our environment looks like and what these soils look like and what the uptake might be. So I've gone through a lot of different kinds of urban soils and the issues. Uh, and in the general, um, something that might seem obvious to some, it's obvious to me, but it, it might not be obvious to you all if you have different disciplines and are not thinking in that way where one of your disciplines is energy or food security or water security, but actually soil security is critical and, and um, integral to um, solving many of the problems for all of the major problems around. Uh, within the soil survey, um, we've made thousands of soil series recognized in the US that act as reference states for the assessment of the capability of the soil to work and helping to monitor uh, uh, reference or, or reference condition. In the case of um, uh, the soil survey, for the most part, most of them have been in agricultural areas and uh, the web soil survey, which is now throughout the US, there's very little of the, um, the soil survey that hasn't been mapped, including in urban areas for a first cut. But in most cases, um, they have not paid attention. They only have the potential to show the capability um, because it was often based not on specific sampling, but on reference sampling. Um, and, and, you know, with that, many products show that reference sampling, whether it's the data hardware, um, the web soil survey, NASA's the National Soil Survey Information System, or the G-Sergo, which is the digital soil survey that you can retrieve either directly or through the web soil survey, where all the data is stored. Um, in my focus with urban soils, um, I really focused on interpretations where taking those reference materials and uh, reference databases and then making them sing by um, uh, interpreting them through uh, the capability of the soil and the specific um, properties. Um, often, these uh, ideas of, uh, in this case, this one is building site development that's on the web soil survey. We created on the basis of um, uh, soil properties, basic soil properties, uh, we, we created interpretations which were then used by laws, programs and regulations and, and broad land use planning. And this is throughout the US and has been the basis for uh, maps throughout the world and increasing, um, helping to increase the public awareness of important environmental concerns that are related not only to soil resources, but to all sorts of major land resource stresses. And, um, and you know, usually, uh, 
you know, we go through a process of making interpretations where we understand the soil, the landscape, the site characteristics that impact the land use and understand, and through that um, developing interpretations that require um, specific interdiscipline, interdisciplinary expertise where uh, it might be a plant scientist but they need to know what aspects of the soils that we can derive from the soil survey base, database and the reference um, measurements, we can derive uh, an interpretation that says how that soil might be used within the interdisciplinary um, expertise. And often we, be, we develop criteria tables for every um, interpretation that uh, work through those important characteristics. Um, so the properties, uh, you start with a pet on description and lab data, you create properties and then it goes to interpretations. And um, you know, some of the inter some of the properties are just straightforward. The same thing we teach our elementary school kids as to what soils are all about, you know, clan sand, silt and clay, structure, amount of gravel and rock, roots and pores, relationship of one layer to another, the color, all are basic things that we define. But then, uh, but then of course with urban soils, we need to go farther uh, with some of the chemical aspects and the ways that soils are working in an urban environment that is different. All of these soil properties, you've got attributes that are directly measured that can be dynamic and changeable or not. And uh, most of those are pH, cation exchange capacity, content of clay, shape of the landform, parent material, um, and uh, creating uh, common stresses that, and documenting common stresses. You think about these common stresses, uh, one might be a heavy load due to vehicular traffic. And what you get from that is physical degradation of cresting, compaction, structural design, and poor health. So you look from this place and then you realize uh, you have um, uh, recommendations of how to control the heavy load and what loads can be the maximum load. And this is how it goes back and forth with all sorts of um, interpretive uh, tables and maps uh, for using for, for, uh, uh, for uh, planning and, and uh, also regulation. So some of the building blocks, I've mentioned them before, texture, horizons, components, pH and CEC, that's cation exchange capacity, bulk density, AWC, available water holding capacity um, based on structure. Uh, hydrology drainage and KSAT, which is uh, water uh, related also to water movement, uh, and erodibility and uh, K and T, which are um, also erodibility factors. And then each soil property impacts the capability of the soil. Relative importance of each can be rated in a system. Uh, the capability of a soil you you decide it for a particular use, and it's often based on many soil site and climatic factors that you that you consider for each one. And here's a list of some of them. Uh, you could refer to these at another time. I'll share these with you, um, the slide set later. And um, and then once we have the soil the soil properties in place, we also think about um, uh, behavior and performance attributes that are not directly measured. We've got measurements and then we have and then we have attributes of how things might work. And some of those attributes might be corrosivity, you know, where how much acid is in the soil or, or uh, materials that might corrode um, metals, uh, tilth, which is the um, the uh, how a soil might hold together, uh, natural drainage, frost action, and wind erodibility as qualities that, that need to be interpreted. And site features such as um, 
uh, slope gradient and mean annual temperature are the different levels are, are often used as different levels for deciding whether something is suitable or not suitable in a particular use, as well as the whole soil properties and the individual individual horizon features that might bring something up. So once again, uh, the most used soil properties, sand, silt, clay, rock fragments, organic matter, and bulk density. Often I do a class um, with some soil scientists where we go through and we actually make an interpretation. And some of these people aren't even soil scientists, they're plant scientists, engineers, other folks, but by using these steps, they start to build their own criteria tables and create an interpretation for their use. And with that, you can create uh, like this one, inherent land quality assessment. For the whole world, we do it. And another one here is um, uh, looking at uh, soil. Um, this, is, this is like a, a potential index uh, for growing corn and soybeans. And it's based on the current climate, but you can adjust it because there's factors talking about how the climate might change. And you can create a map that shows its potential in a drier climate or a wetter climate or a, a, another predictive climate. So these are some of the, the examples. Um, uh, and uh, the benefits of using all of this is that um, you have you, you have to tailor the questions of sustainability and climate change and uh, to local, regional, or global scale, and then you can scale up or you can scale down. You guys can visualize how this might be incredibly useful uh, from a politics standpoint or a policy standpoint, but also from uh, making uh, some sense of you know a very specific small study in a small place and scaling it up to let's say a whole county or as I did in early in my career or the whole world as I did later in my career. Uh, here are some of the soil archives that NRCS has. I'm gonna just quickly go through this. This is what the analytical data often looks like. And, um, and this soil survey archive that's in Lincoln, Nebraska uh, was started in the 1940s, has samples from 80 countries and all the US states and territories and it's samples that you as students could use in your research uh, with a request. And you can see it's in the natural state and then also in the pulverized state for fine uh, looking at um, these were some of the properties and a lot of the work also has been uh, looked at from an MIR spectrometer point of view where we can uh, do a lot more different calculations from old properties that from old soil samples that we had from the 20s or the 30s or the 40s that are now um, being rescanned for total carbon, CEC, clay, pH, carbonates, and heavy metals. And from those predictions, models can be built um, for all the archived samples. And uh, this MR, MIR library is being used to predict soil properties throughout the US and the world. But that's something that you all could do in your own work is creating these kind of uh, archives for Louisiana. So the last thing I'm gonna cover, and let me check the time. Yeah, we're doing okay. Um, uh, is uh, to talk a little bit about soil taxonomy. Uh, I left you at the beginning of uh, this talk uh, about the beginning of my career, which is I had very few tools to do that soil survey of Baltimore City. In the meantime, uh, time went on, uh, the importance of soils, in urban areas became more and more important, more and more cities after Baltimore City, uh, particularly New York, but then all the major cities requested soil surveys. And in fact, cities all over the world started requesting soil surveys to do their planning. Um, and with that, 
we realized that our system of classification was not enough. When I did the soil survey of Baltimore, when I'd hit an area that was entirely fill or um, entirely disturbed soils, and um, this was a complex process, but I was able to do that. Um, when I would delineate those areas, I just have to call them what we call eudorthans uh, uh, in, in the classification, which is generalized mixed up material. And then I would, uh, I would categorize it as contaminated fill or, or uh, native fill or um, soils from the coastal plain or soils from the, um, the Piedmont. Uh, you know, I was characterizing the material, but I wasn't actually talking about its genesis or process. In the last, uh, I'd say it was the last 10 years, uh, we started to really think about this and think that we needed to categorize these soils and urban areas more fully as to their genesis and their use. And as we did that, we put together a new soil order for taxonomy that would address specifically urban soils. And this was the pro proposal justification, uh, human altered and human transported materials spread across the land surface under shallow water or uh, on the land surface. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the new order is justified because and this, these are some of the points I've already covered. Artifacts do not weather the same, byproducts are unique. Many artifacts are hazardous to human health and safety. We know little about these soils, even though most of us work and travel on them and most of us live on them. Um, internal structure, water movement, strength, subsidence, liquid, liquefaction are all potentially, are with all potential, but is different than in native systems. And, um, and fertility and carbon storage are different. And uh, soil quality functions and ecosystem surface, uh, services are highly altered and then less predictable within our standard prediction um, criteria. So where would they occur, these new soils? Um, cities, sub suburbs, villages, transportation quarters, mine and spoil areas, which is something we often don't think about. Um, uh, terraced uh, hill slopes, building pads, airports, levees, dams, and other anthropogenic landforms with more than 50 centimeters of fill or cut and fill, which is most of our urban areas, um, surprisingly so. Um, those anthropogenic landforms, um, uh, you know, often are not even uh, visible. As I said, in New York, some of these anthropogenic landforms were created in the 1700s. They look like normal soils now. It's, it's interesting to think about. Uh, so uh, we go back through some of the lists of uh, soils and, and their types. Artifact laden in sealed soils. He, these are sealed, these are full of artifacts excavated and replaced soils. As you can imagine, even in an agricultural area, you might see these. Human transported material, like in old landfills that are then recreated to uh, urban landscapes that you might live or work in. Uh, deeply plowed or excavated soils are not included, which uh, I would have liked to seen them included, but they're not in this case. So they called, uh, they decided on the name artisols. Uh, I would have liked something like anthrosols, but they wanted to separate uh, soils that were um, natural, you know, still being used for agriculture versus ones that uh, have a lot of artifacts in them. So they used that formative element arts. And here are artifact samples that there has to be artifact samples in the soils to do this urban uh, description and uh, of all sorts. And, heart, and if they are um, 
hazardous uh, artifacts that um, we need to identify them. And um, so, you know, they also are looking at heavy metals and thinking about heavy metals and how they might um, react in systems, new systems uh, as nickel, lead, arsenic and um, cobalt in this case. And uh, starting to work and looking at uh, data exploration with combined data over large areas. So we're starting to collect data from all sorts of areas, including that um, archive that we have in, um, in, in Lincoln, Nebraska that I showed you earlier, but uh, also in universities around the country. So there's also a discussion worldwide with, uh, this is the uh, world reference base, which is um, the reference base criteria for um, classifying soils throughout the world. They have a slightly different system that was organized by the World Soil Congresses uh, for all, all countries. Um, the system that's in the US is meant for all countries, but, uh, uh, every country for many, many, uh, for s several decades, developed their own classification system and to sort of control the chaos, they put together a team uh, to look at the world reference base and to build a European, at least an Asian reference base. And, um, and it, it's a little bit of a competition, but I've been on committees for many years now where we've tried to combine the two systems together and at least understand each other. And so both of these systems um, speak to each other. And in this case, uh, the urban system is technosols is what they describe. And uh, they have technosols and they have anthrosols, which are the native soils and artisols is a combination of both. So they have a key here. I won't go into the key specifically, but it, it, um, it's once again, looking at human transported material as the focus. And here are some of the proposed great groups, which are the big separations, uh, subaqueous and periaqueous conditions, wet conditions. Uh, these are wet conditions, but have some artificial drainage or, or native drainage that makes it that you can actually use, they're not underneath water. Um, these are ones, uh, fact arts that are ones that are innocuous materials and, uh, and then oath arts are ones that have a um, few artifacts that are getting into the, uh, but enough to fulfill this categorization. And then uh, they separated into ha uh, hazard material and um, other material that isn't quite as hazardous. Here's one that's sulfitic. Um, it's something that you need to take a little time and study. So you'll have some of these slides to look at it. Uh, and then here, I'm gonna just quickly go through um, some of the pictures of these materials. Um, this one is uh, subaqueous soils. Uh, some of it is uh, a little bit hazardous material, and, and uh, you can see what it looks like here. Um, shallow impoundments that have soils on the margins in urban areas, that's where this one would go. Um, and this one is uh, where there's more hazardous materials, but uh, you can see that gray color. That's indicative, as we all know, as people who have studied soils know, of uh, potentially very wet soils and reduced soil conditions uh, with reduced iron. This one is the sulfuric acid. I think I talked about these sulfitic materials uh, when you get pyrite and other uh, uh, wastes from uh, coal mining, you might end up with these sulfuric uh, horizons uh, or sulfuric materials, also sediments that have high pyrite in them, uh, where uh, the sulfur has oxidized and uh, created a sulfuric acid and created extremely low pHs. Uh, 
And uh, I'm just checking, there we go. Uh, we also have sandy soils here, um, uh, where sandy materials, where there's been dredge, common in coastal cities, uh, compacted um, construction sites uh, with dense layers below, that's really dense layers below and compaction. Uh, uh, this is one that has shallow groundwater at the construction site. This one has a lot of uh, cold ta tailings, um, bare soil, toxic to plants, dangerous to humans. Um, I remember this site. We actually saw this site in um, South Africa. Um, it also had a sulfuric acid, um, very extremely low pH down below at the bottom. It was quite dramatic as uh, gold mine tailings. Um, oil spills, this is something you might see in Louisiana that would need your attention, whether you were a biological person or a, um, a soils person specifically. Uh, and then uh, landfills with manufacturing capped landfills and also old landfills, but pre-regulations where everything's all mixed up and unlined. And then, um, and then here, haplo uh, fact arts where these are, anything haplo is where uh, it's not hazardous. It might be hazardous, but it's, uh, it, it's not necessarily material that's contaminated. Back to the oil spill has hazardous. Um, and then this one is uh, interesting in that this one is um, organic materials that have been laid purposely like a big compost pile over the centuries. Uh, this one is the terra preta, which is found in uh, Mexico and South America where um, uh, the uh, native people that settled there and did agriculture enriched the soil with organic matter for centuries and created this stable material uh, in, at least in South America and is quite well known. Um, so sandy material again, um, and then uh, material that has been excavated and replaced entirely with new material. This happens in many places where, uh, for instance, those acid sulfate soils where they cannot be repaired and they, can't, and they have to be reclaimed in some way and they bring new material in. We also see this sometimes just in regular developments where they saved topsoil from somewhere and then they bring it in. So they usually only bring in about a foot, not, not 20 feet. And, um, and then another one of these soils that uh, uh, has few artifacts. So um, I'm down to the conclusions, which is that um, HAHT, which is uh, uh, soils that have been transported or, or uh, affected by anthropogenic um, activity are important on a number of levels. They're different from other soils. They can be identified in the field and they can be mapped. And these are our urban soils very often or highly affected soils in agricultural areas. Uh, a risk of elevated heavy metal content has been established and USDA has started to acknowledge that perhaps it's now time to start reevaluating our urban areas in terms of the elevated heavy metal content, if nothing else, the capability of retaining it or dealing with it. Um, Agricultural soils that require greater uh, spe specification, human altered acid sulfate soils and excavated soils, but not replaced are recognized as integrates uh, to this material. And uh, hazardous soils and deep uh, uh, human transported materials, uh, HTM, are more important to human, animal, and and plant health and water quality than 
than once we once um, uh, recognized and that uh, uh, we're hoping that a new soil order is on the way. So I wanted to um, uh, just recognize that I took some of this material from uh, previous presentations on soil capability and recognize these folks, these other folks that I used to work with and that I still admire and, um, and are, are very excellent resources as if you want to deal into this uh, business as well as the folks here, and I'm missing a couple of names. Uh, also, um, uh, uh, we've got Dr. John Galbraith uh, with the Artisol Soil, US Soil Taxonomy, Richard Shaw, Randy Riddle, Christine Ryan, but there's also um, Curtis Monger who works, uh, he was working for USDA and was in charge of standards. And he recently retired and has returned to New Mexico State University. And he's also a resource um, as a emeritus um, uh, professor there at, in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Uh, 